Thank you for being with us today. We would love to have you join us in person. To partner with us or to give online, go to www.upperroomohio.com. We hope you enjoy this message. Man, we are so honored to have you. We're excited. I'm going to ask my dad to come up here. So come on up, dad. This is, uh, just want to introduce you individually to uh, Greg, Pastor Greg, or affectionately known in Upper Room as Dad. So, uh, yep. I'm blessed. Um, he and my mom started Upper Room in December of 1998, and I'm honored to carry the legacy and continue to to just go forward, and uh, just a really fun guy. He loves stories, he loves people, and the more you're around him, the more entertaining and the better his stories even get. So, so anyway, he's awesome. So if you haven't got to know him, get to know him, and I'm just honored to be able to do ministry with him. I'm a third generation pastor, naturally and spiritually, so just excited. I've, I've got the best of every world. I've got a good spiritual dad, an amazing natural dad, and more than anything, an Abba dad who's the most incredible Amen. father on the earth, right? Amen. So anyways, love you, Dad. You. Happy Father's Day. My, my stories are like wine. And they get better with time. <laughs> That's right. Like a classic car, right? All right. Um, we're going we're gonna to co-preach today. Micah Level is uh, the youth pastor, young adult pastor here. Uh, he's, he and Meredith have been here for about a year and a half now, maybe a little more. Known them just a few months beyond that. We met it's kind of a supernatural, divine encounter, how we met. Um, so it's exciting. But more than that, he has come in and submitted and just been the most amazing spiritual son uh, that I could imagine. And uh, he and Meredith are just so special to us. He's also one of my best friends. He got a kayak for Father's Day, and now I did. So I'm pretty sure there's some plans in our future, and hopefully I don't have to get mine licensed since it's inflatable. I hope not. We'll have to figure that out. But uh, Nicole and I, we sold, I had a speedboat. I had a Baja Islander. It had through-haul exhaust. It sounded like a Harley on water, all right? I love to water ski and do all the fun water sports. And this thing just flat out flew on the water. I was one of the fastest boats on the water, but it's certainly the loudest, all right? And, and we were getting married. We were engaged. And we're like, let's sell the boat. And because it was wood, it was a wood interior, we wanted fiberglass in the future. So we're like, let's sell it, and then we'll upgrade later, all right? So we sold it to pay for our wedding, and then we said we'd upgrade later. This is the first upgrade I've gotten. 14 years. Woo! So I'm on my way to new boats. So anyways, thanks. Um, we're we're going to just co-speak here, and I'm really excited. Actually, I don't know why I'm using that. There we go. That, that was kind of funny. I brought the book of awesome back, all right? You guys ready for it? We got some awesome things uh, that we're gonna go with today. And then I got a side note on this one, all right? So this is the book of awesome, just funny things that are awesome. First one, seeing a cop on the side of the road and realizing you're going the speed limit anyway. That's awesome. <laughs> side note, three weeks ago, Nicole and I were going to Cincinnati on date day, all right? So we're driving down the road. All of a sudden, I see the cop on the side of the road. He's out with his radar, you know, at his door. And I look down, and I'm going 24 miles per hour over. I'm like, oh, we're like in this great conversation. We're laughing, all these things. And I realize, oh, boy, he gets in his car. He shuts the door. He pulls up way right behind me. I merge to the middle lane. He merges behind me. I merge to the slow lane. He merges behind me. I'm like, baby, this is it. We're getting pulled over on date night. So, so anyway, guys, this is just a word of wisdom. Don't rush through date night, all right? So all of a sudden, the blue Christmas lights light up, and I'm like, ah. So I pull over. He walks up to the, uh, to the car. He's like, who's the firefighter? Where are you a firefighter at? Because I have a sticker on the back of my car. I'm like, Troy, my wife and I were on date night. I'm just like, blah, blah, blah. He's like, hey, it's okay. Calm down. He's like, I'm not going to tell you how fast you were going. That might have to lead to other stuff. So let me just run your license. He comes back. He's like, hey, here's a warning. Slow it down. Enjoy your date night. So when you get pulled over and don't get a ticket, that's awesome. Okay, moving on. Naps. Those are awesome. When you get the milk to cereal ratio just right. 
That's awesome. High-fiving babies. That's awesome. The smell of new babies' heads. That's awesome. When you're awkwardly standing by yourself with a full cafeteria tray of food, and the cafeteria is full, and then suddenly you spot your friend waving to welcome you to a seat. That's awesome. All right, we'll do one more. Having a whole row to yourself on the airplane. That's awesome. All right. So N Micah and I, we um, kind of planned this. It was funny. We had a, he's going to tell about a story that happened, and then he replies with this elaborate, amazing text. And I was like, Micah, that will preach one day. So today's the day. So he'll get to that. But I'm going to kick it off here. Turn with me to Genesis 37. We're also going to be in 1 Samuel. We're just going to start by reading some texts and take you through a life of two amazing men in the Bible and the father-son relationship there and what that looks like today on Father's Day and what, what this is fitting as dads and as sons and daughters, okay? And then we'll go through the process here and get you out of here to your barbecues in about two hours, okay? All right. I'll be honest with you. You guys are so good. You, I say that every week, I think, and you laugh every time. Thank you. That's awesome. Okay, Genesis 37, 11 says this. It says, but while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. So Joseph had just gotten done talking and telling uh, his brothers and his dad about all these crazy dreams he's having and, and what it looked like. So his brothers are jealous, but his dad wondered what the dreams were about. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem. When they had been gone for some time, Jacob said to Joseph, your brothers are pasturing the sheep at Shechem. Get ready and I will send you to them. I'm ready to go, Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along, Jacob said. Then come back and bring me a report. So Jacob sent him on his way and Joseph traveled to Shechem from their home in the valley of Hebron. When he arrived there, a man from the area noticed him wandering around the countryside. What are you looking for, he asked. I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph replied. Do you know where they are pasturing their sheep? Yes, the man told him. They have moved on from here, but I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph followed his brothers to Dothan and found them there. Let's move on to 1 Samuel 17 and talk a little bit about David here. 1 Samuel 17, starting at verse 12, we'll go through 20. This will be the majority of the text we read today. Now David was the son of a man named Jesse, an Ephratite from Bethlehem. By the way, uh, I did not get a degree in pronunciation of biblical names or cities, okay? There's grace over that. From Bethlehem in the land of Judah, Jesse was an old man at that time, and he had eight sons. Jesse's three oldest son, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shemiah, had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son. David's three oldest brothers stayed with Saul's army, but David went back and forth so he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champions strutted in front of the Israelite army. One day, Jesse said to David, take this basket of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers and give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army at the Valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the gifts as Jesse has directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Now, here's, here's what I want to do. I want to focus on the life of David, but also a little bit more on Joseph. And what this meant, first off, this wasn't just some easy journey that they were sending them. It wasn't like, hey, run into town and get a loaf of bread and bring it back so we can have our barbecue today. It wasn't like, hey, take I-75 to Walmart and Troy in your Tesla and, and go, go take care of that for us. No, David's journey was actually 15 miles through the mountains, a full day and night. It was a day's journey. Joseph's journey all the way from, from Hebron to where he was going, it was 60 miles through the mountains. Now picture, I have a little experience hiking through the mountains now. I can come from an experienced person and we maybe hiked three miles in the mountains and it was terrible. 
So imagine hiking 60 miles through Gatlinburg or the Appalachian Trail. That, that's the similar terrain. So this was, and, and bringing all this food and bringing all these things and figuring this out, this was not an easy task. But here's the thing about a father. Here's the thing about, about Jesse and Jacob. They actually were commissioning. They had, uh, these, these young men had already been commissioned, but they were sending them to their destiny. This wasn't a thing about really checking on the brothers. Listen, it was getting them to their destiny. It wasn't just about, hey, your brothers are hungry. No, it was, it was sending them. And in order to do that, they actually had to trust their sons. They actually had to honor. They had to empower them with responsibility. They gave them an assignment for the alignment, right? We've heard Leif say that all the time. Listen, their assignment was given them. Jacob had already put the coat of many colors on Joseph. They already had the assignment. Now they were actually, they already had the alignment. Now they were being sent into their assignment. Same thing with David. He was called to be king as a young boy at a table. That had already happened. So now he's actually being sent to his assignment. He's actually fulfilling his destiny now. Here's the other thing. And the last thing that, that I want to mention at least is not just that, that he was being sent. Listen, he had already been commissioned. Now they're being sent. It was also not that he trusted him and was giving him and empowering him through responsibility. Listen, there comes a point in time that's so hard as a parent, but then you're saying, get out of the nest, it's your turn to fly. There's something so hard about that. Are they going to make it? Are they going to be hungry? Are they going to do these things? Are they going to be able to survive? Are they going to be able to take care of their kids on their own? I remember when we, when we had Chloe, and I remember walking through the door, and literally, we walked through our garage, our, our door, we had a garage park in the garage, walked through the house. I remember walking through and we get into our kitchen. I'm like, I remember literally thinking, where's the manual? Like, where's the owner's manual to this? They, like, they trusted me with this little breathing thing right now? Like, this, is, this is crazy, right? So I remember that, but there's a time, and, and I remember even calling Nicole's mom. She's a nurse. And I was like, hey, we call her like, oh, the belly button's like all brown and crusty. And uh, what do we do? Like, what? It, it fell off. This thing fell off. I don't think this is supposed to happen yet. You know, it's like, uh, but are we going to survive? So this was what Joseph was, and David were being done with their parents. They were, the fathers were actually sending them. The last thing, each one of them said, now bring back a report. Now come back. Now, now here's the thing, and the fun thing about fathering, and the fun thing about mothering is you actually allow your kids to come back. Listen, they were being blessed to be sent, but no matter what it looks like, a father and a mother love their kids unconditionally, no matter what, there's an open door policy at my house. You look at the prodigal story and you look, listen, this, this guy left. He didn't leave with an inheritance. He actually left with money. His inheritance, he didn't have the blessing of an inheritance yet. He took it too early. So he goes and it says that he spent it on riotous living. He was spending it on prostitutes, on alcohol, and all these things that are unimaginable. Yeah, unimaginable. He's spending this thing, and, 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 but yet what happened when he returned to the house? Listen, when he saw the house, it wasn't the son that came running. It was actually the father that threw open the door and came bolting and running, breaking every cultural rule of the time to embrace his son. No matter how a child leaves, no matter how they're sent or how they're not sent, no matter how they leave, they're always welcome back. That's the beautiful thing about a loving mom and a dad. And listen, no matter where you've been in your life, no matter where you went and sinned or how long you were there or what you did while you were there, the father is welcoming you back into the house. He's welcoming prodigals back. He's welcoming the rebellious back. Listen, it was not just about the son who left. It was also about the rebellious son who was in the house. He stayed there disgruntled and mad and angry and jealous and bitter. What did the father say? He loved him at the end of the story. Let me, let me just paint the picture for you in modern day. I'm always welcome back at my dad's house, all right? I remember my wife and I, we first got married, and uh, neither of us really knew how to cook all that much. She was really amazing at cooking spaghetti, all right? That was like her go-to two, three, four, five times a week, all right? <laughs> I still, to this day, kind of just like, just shove spaghetti in my mouth. I'm like, oh, because we ate it so much. <laughs> She hates it when I say that, but we did. We ate spaghetti a lot. So neither of us, one of us at that time knew how to cook real well. And I worked a 24-hour uh, schedule at the fire department. I'd work one whole day and night, get 48 hours off. And uh, I just remember, like, we would get on the phone and be like, hey, Mom, how, how's it going? What, what's for supper tonight? Uh, wow, okay, pot roast, awesome. Um, do you have enough for Nicole and I? Yeah, okay, all right. We'll call you right back, Okay. 
Nicole, get on the phone. Hey, Mom, what are you guys having for supper tonight? Oh, lasagna? Oh, yeah, do you have enough for Aaron and I? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, okay, half hour? Yeah, we'll be there. Me. Hey, Mom, um, we're actually just going to go to Nicole's mom and dad's tonight, but uh, maybe we could call you tomorrow night and make something happen there, okay? All right, <laughs> love you. Bye. Like at least two, three times a week we were doing this, all right? Because why? Because we're always welcome back at the house. And then we get to the house, and we wouldn't knock. We wouldn't wait. Even if Nicole's parents' house was locked at the front door, we'd go. We'd find that hidden key in the garage, and we would, we'd know exactly how to get in that place. We'd just barge right in, all right? And then I'd go to the fridge, and I'd open the fridge. And at my dad's house, I'd get diet right. It's just what was there. And Nicole's moms we're, we're, and dads were getting, you know, iced tea or lemonade. And it's just, you just help yourself. Get a cup, get the ice. Why? Because we're always welcome back. That's the thing about the Father's love. That's the thing about the Father's house. That's the thing about the kingdom. You're always welcome. The door's always open. And no matter how, where you go, how far you get there, it's always open. Now, now let me paint the picture. And then is going to talk about the sun approach here. There was something really, really cool that happened. And, and here's what, what is neat. He's telling David, and, and, and Joseph's telling Joseph, Jacob's telling Joseph, he's saying, now go do this. Now listen, this is a little brother. How many little, how many younger siblings do we have in here? I'm the youngest of four. And when my brother was in the Navy, I want to be in the Navy. I want to do that. You know, like your older siblings are your heroes. I want to drive. I, I shouldn't have to wait till I'm 16 to do that, right? Well, they're out with their friends. I want to be out with my friends. Aaron, you're five. Still, so th this is right. So you could imagine, but he said, "No, take the food. This is your role. You're the little. You're the little brother of the family. Both of them were. So, but it was out of submission and obedience. It was out of honor for the father just to do what he was being told and asked to do. The last thing, and then I'm going to let Micah take it over from here. It was. It was actually knowing and trusting that the father had the best interest at heart for him." And he's got this incredible story at the end of his, his, his part here. It's like, listen, as a father and a mother with a true, genuine heart to be a father and mother, we have the best interests of our kids at heart. But then there's this trust factor. I'm going to trust that, that Mike is going to do what's best. They had to trust that David and Joseph were going to do what's best. But then David and Joseph actually had to trust that their dads knew what they were talking about. Last thing, back, back to when I called my mom or her mom for parent advice. Like, all of a sudden, we had kids, and boom, instantly, our parents got smart. Like, it was like, whoa, mom and dad are smart, right? How many else felt that way? You're like, I know more than them. They're stupid. And then all of a sudden, you have kids. You're like, wait, we need help. And hey, uh, can you babysit? No, they actually know what they're talking about. And I, we have to, it, it takes life experience. It takes these things when all of a sudden they're rescuing, they're giving us advice, they're helping us, they're speaking into our life. But we have to trust that they have that best interest and they're actually full of wisdom. We also have to trust that they love us and they care for us. And sometimes even when we disagree, we still submit because that's what honor looks like. But Micah, go ahead, take it from here. It's good. Is this on? You guys can hear me? All right. It's awesome. So good. I want to bring like the perspective of a son. Um, it's so good, like this heart of the father. Aaron's such a great, you know, carries the heart of the father so well. I've been learning so much about the heart of the father uh, just in my short time, you know, two years of being in a relationship with him. Um, but there's, man, there's so, this, this thing, you know, this tension of two sides of, you know, the fathers trusting the sons and releasing them and empowering them into their destinies, letting them run and that trust, but then also on our end, there's this trust of like, I'm, I need to trust that they're looking out for my best interest. Trusting that the Father is looking out for your best interest. And there's the, and the part, of, the component for us is submission in servanthood. Submission in our heart, having a heart submitted, walking in submission in our heart, in a servant heart, a servant posture. And then out of that, it's, we trust the Father. And it's actually really easy to trust, or it's really easy to submit when you trust. It's, it comes natural to submit when you actually can trust each other's hearts. You trust the Father's heart. And that's why God doesn't, it's in the, God the Father, it's like he doesn't have us follow him aimlessly. He w wants us to know his character and his nature and then his character that he's really, really good. And because he's really good, it's actually really easy to submit to him and to serve him because he's a good father. 
And that's exactly what we see happening here. This has like been true of my life. Uh, this is what we see happening here. I really wanted to touch on uh, the story of David in uh, 1 Samuel 17. And you see the story in David. David's, you know, what is he doing? What is he doing in the midst of this story? He's serving his father. He's taking care of his father's sheep. He's tending the sheep in the field. David, like if you look at this story, David's not going to slay a giant. He's going to give his brothers food. He's not going to give his to slay this giant. He, in his mind, he literally has this heart posture just to serve. This heart posture to serve. If you see the story, you know, we read about it here, but my translation says that David's three brothers went away or abandoned their father. And these three brothers, if, you, if it starts in the story, you know, Goliath is taunting the, the army of Israel. He's taunting and, you know, attacking every day for 40 days. Hey, send out your best guy and, like, I'm going to slay him and you will be my servant. And his three brothers literally flee and leave his, they abandon their father and they go to, to war. They're like, we want to go to better things. We want to go to great things in their mind. Like, we, we got to get away from this farm. We want to achieve amazing things. And they abandon their father and they run off. And here's David, he's the only one that goes back and forth to his father. Back and forth, and he's serving, and he's tending his father's sheep. He's caring for his father's sheep. And what, what you see is then it, it goes on where David, he arrives. Basically, his father's like, hey, I need you to take all this stuff. I need you to take this food. I need you to take this. And I want you to go to my sons because I miss them. They don't write letters to me. They don't write letters to me. They're just off doing their thing. I want to know about how they're doing. Can you go talk to them? Can you tell me how they're doing? Can you bring this food? And David, even though it's not even in a line with his assignment, from the perspective of a son, his assignment is the sheep. It's not even, it actually is not even in alignment to what he's supposed to be doing. He's caring for sheep, but he submits his heart to the father. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to go take this food to my brothers. So he does that long voyage and he gets there. And when he, when he arrives, they're going at war. They're at war and he sees the giant in the valley taunting all of Israel. And instantly this thing leap, leaps up in his heart and he's like, hey, what would it, what's going to happen? What's the reward? What's going to happen for the man that kills that, that giant? What's going to happen? You know, what, what will be given to him? And the men start telling David of what will, be, what will happen. Like, you know, well, the king will give, him, give you his daughter and all this stuff. But the last thing that they say is, and Saul will make the man of that father, that man, the man's father's house tax-free. And I personally believe that that's, that was what drove David to sit, be, stand before Saul. Right? When he heard, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm serving my father, I'm taking care of sheep, and I'm just here delivering sandwiches. I, 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 I can make my father's house tax-free. And there was this passion in his heart of, I want to serve my father. And so he's like, he starts talking about it and talking about it until he's set before Saul, set before the king. And Saul, as he set before the king, Saul right away is like, dude, you're way too small. What are you, what are you doing here? Like, go back home to your farm. And, and David makes this stunning statement. He's like, no, I have been tending to my father's sheep. I've been serving my father. I've been tending my father's sheep. <clears throat> Sorry. I've been tending my father's sheep. And as he's attending his father's sheep, a lion comes, a bear comes. And David naturally slays the lion and he slays the bear. But for David, I, what I want you to see is I'm talking about all this stuff. He says, you know, I've slayed a lion. I've slayed a bear. So I can take down this giant. I can slay this giant. This giant will be no different to me. But what I want you to look at is that David never knew that he was going to slay a giant. He didn't. He knew that he was anointed king. There was never a, a plan in there for him to slay a giant. There was a plan for him to take his brother some bread and encourage them and strengthen them and to bring a word back to his father. And that's, that's the same. Literally, in David's life, as he was going about, submitted in his heart to the father, he suddenly is prepared for this giant. David was prepared for his destiny by serving his father's destiny. It's true. Da David, his, his heart in posture to submission was actually what brought his breakthrough. Submission brought his breakthrough. Is that good? Like, I just want you to see that David wasn't tending sheep so that he could get to something greater. He was tending sheep because for him that was great. For him that was his giant. That was his, you know, so many times we think that being a father or being, you know, working a nine to five or all these different things are second class in Christianity, but it's the most amazing thing. Being a father, being a mom, 
living your life in the fullest with Christ is the most amazing thing. That's the, and that's exactly what David got. David's like, I'm just serving my family. I'm serving my father. And unknowingly, he's set up to slay these giants and enter to his destiny. And it's like totally the same for us. Like as we walk in submission to the father, as we walk in submission to the father and even into one another in the family, we're actually propelled into our destinies. We're propelled into our destinies as we have this heart posture of submission. That's totally been like my life. That's been what's happened to me. Like in my life, every form of breakthrough or defining moment in my life in the kingdom and things that God has brought into my life has all come through the context of submitting my heart to the Father. Submitting my heart to the Father. There's an example. I'll share a story. I was... um, came in here about a year and a half ago we met about maybe two years ago and when we came here honestly for years i've had a dream to preach in detention centers and in prisons i've always had this dream i'm an evangelist i love the gospel i've always had this dream to preach in detention centers but i've never been one to like really push myself out there into you know like things that god promises me i just want to like see what he brings to my table it's kind of been my thought the way i've done things so anyways, I get here and honestly came here with this heart to serve. I never asked Aaron about detention. I had no idea that, he, you know, the founding uh, father of the church like, also founded a detention center. You know what I mean? I had no idea. I'm just like, I love them. I'm like, man, I, re- we wa- I want to go serve Aaron and Cole. And then we get here and he's like, hey, can you serve me by preaching at a detention center every other, you know, kind of a thing. And I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, it was just a total dream fulfilled. To, come, to preach in a detention center. And it's been amazing. This last year was a huge highlight of my year to see you know, all these kids get saved and miracles in the detention center. So I love that. But it didn't come with me like pursuing the giant. It just came with me t- pursuing a submitted heart to serve. You see what I mean? And that's totally, that's, that's, that is for everything in life. In t- spiritually this way with the Father, but even this way with our leadership. Is that submitted heart to serve. Does that make sense? James, it talks about, you know, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. A lot of times we want the devil to flee, but we aren't willing to submit. It doesn't say, you know, you have to, you you know, flee the devil and all this stuff, and then I'll submit to you. It says, no, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Your breakthrough is on the other side of submission. It's on the other side of submission. If you, a lot of times we want it to be the other way around. We want our breakthrough, but we don't want to submit, and we actually have to submit to find the breakthrough. And that's exactly what happened with David. Does that make sense? So to go on with this, like, so it was actually just earlier this this year uh, on Easter weekend. So I, I had been, spe- you know, preaching in the detention center every other month or whatever, and I was supposed to schedule to preach on Easter Sunday at the detention center, and it's at 10 a.m. It's at a weird time, so I kind of would miss the 9 and 11 a.m. services. And uh, I was all pumped and excited about it. And Aaron just, he sent me a text. He said, hey, man, like, uh, I, I was, I think it'd be really wise if you, like, switched, you know, sw- uh, switched your schedule with somebody and gave this to somebody else. Um, and I remember instantly, and I didn't tell Aaron this, because right away I texted him this, like, thing, like, yes, like, absolutely. <laughs> but inside I'm, like, wrestling. I'm like, what? Isn't it the greatest thing to, like, preach the gospel on Easter Sunday? And a detention center. And I'm all like, because I'm an evangelist. So I'm like, what? This is the epitome of Easter. <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm like all, I, this is like literally inner going on for a few minutes. And I don't, I don't even know if any Meredith even knew. I'm just there like <laughs> looking at my phone like, oh, like wrestling. And then, but then I just, I was like, you know, and in my mind, I'm like, that's what's going on. I don't understand. I don't understand. Like this doesn't make, it doesn't compute to my perspective of what I see. My perspective is like, you know what I mean? So I'm just seeing it in terms of like, I'm an evangelist, so you, be gracious with me. But I'm like, you know, be in a church building or be out with the lost on Easter Sunday. You know, like, that's my mind. That's where I'm going. That's the only thing I could see. And I, but then I, in my heart, I just, I just I readjusted. I said, you know what, I'm going to submit to this. So I said, yeah, absolutely. So I called the guy, a guy to replace. We quickly, you know, made schedules to replace. It wasn't a big deal at all. And instantly, right when I did that, there was suddenly all this, like, understanding that flooded in. Like, instantly. And Aaron texted me. He's like, man, I'm so proud of you. Like, thanks for, 
you know, doing that. I really think it's wisdom for you to be here with your family. And it was like suddenly this understanding, this light bulb turned on. I'm like, oh my gosh, this isn't about like a service on Sunday or like, or preaching the gospel in a detention center. This is about being with my family and being with my wife and my kids. And that's what Aaron was protecting. See what I mean? So when, sometimes submitting can be hard and it can be, it can be this determining moment, but it, there's always breakthrough on the other side. And that was the breakthrough that I needed. Does that make sense? And a lot of times we want to understand and then we'll submit, but we actually have to submit and then we'll understand. We, in terms of with God, like we think we're like God, like it, we don't, we remove faith and we're like, hey, I want to understand exactly why you're commanding me to do this and I'll obey you after I understand. But you actually have to submit and obey and then the understanding comes. The understanding follows the submission. It's just true. And a lot of times I feel like we see, you know, revelation and breakthrough in other people's lives. I, I know we all have heroes in the faith, but even just heroes in life, like people that we look up to that have achieved, you know, like David, like slayed a giant or something. We look up to these giant slayers and we all want to be giant slayers. But at the end of the day, we, a lot of times we don't want to take, do what it takes to get there. And it's submission. It's just plain and simple submission to the Father. It doesn't get, you know, it's can't, there's no other way around it. So I, what I wanted to end with is just a real exhortation of, you know, covenant is the only transport that will carry you to your destiny. Earlier last year, I was driving down 70, and I saw this huge semi-truck, and it was pulling a trailer, and on the side of the trailer, it said covenant transport. And right away, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, Micah, covenant is the only transport that will carry you to your destiny. It's the only transport that will carry you to your destiny. And what I want to encourage you is like the only way to your destiny, the only way into more breakthrough in the kingdom is submission and being connected in covenant to the family of God, to the family around you, being submitted to the Father, but then submitted to spiritual fathers and mothers in your life. It's the way into breakthrough. It's the covenant transport to your destiny. It really is. So I just want to encourage you just with that, just to... Not look for your destiny or your breakthrough anywhere outside of the, the boundaries of covenant. Because it won't be there. You won't find it. You won't find your destiny outside of the context of community and covenant. Does that make sense? Amen. That's all I got today. <laughs> Thanks for letting me share. I, I just find it interesting that he brings up the covenant to end it because it's the relationship of a father and a son that actually was the key to the kingdom, the key to the lost, the key to heaven. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, right? It's that connection of the father and the son and, and even his prayer in the New Testament and the gospel says, says if, if only the people understand I and you and you and me, this is, this is the, the prayer of the father and the son coming together as one. And, and I feel that's God's desire in our lives, you know, naturally, spiritually, but more so the kingdom. And, and I just, I find it interesting that the covenant peace, because even Joseph, when he was coming, it was actually, he was leaving Hebron to go to his destiny. Hebron is translated from the word of, that means covenant and unity. So he's coming from covenant to reach his destiny and eventually ends up in a, in a pit being sold to slavery, ends up in prison. But the end result was his destiny of ruling and reigning under Pharaoh and ruling the kingdom through that. The other thing, you know, David, he's, he, he not only, this, this thing happened in Bethlehem, but, you know, as Leif's been here and he, he mentioned that. And if you want to know more about some of this David stuff, his newest book, Giant Slayers, is incredible. So, but anyway, he, he eventually goes into a duelum where it's this, his cave time, all these people come to him, etc. And then, he, but he ends in Hebron before he rules and reigns in Zion. Hebron is the place of covenant. It's, it's where the mighty men of 300, you know, the mighty 300, it's, it's all these things. So he's going from covenant. So, so David then, he, through this story, he, he reaches his destiny. He, first off, you know, Saul's trying to put his armor on him, trying to do all these things. And, and listen, sometimes it's actually just showing up where you're supposed to, where you feel God and you're submitting to him. So he submits to a natural father. He submits to the Lord's will in his life. He ends up at this battle, and, and he picks up this rock. And he picks up these five stones, puts them in his satchel, and, 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 and he was actually a skilled marksman in the slingshot. 
So he picks it up, but, but here's the thing. It comes from the word. The, the stone that killed Goliath and hit him in the head actually was Aben, which means father-son. I just feel like there's this covenant, there's this, there's this peace that God is, is releasing. You know, he says, in the last days, I'm going to pour out my, my spirit on all flesh. Sons and daughters will prophesy. It talks about young men and old men and dreams and visions. It talks about, listen, he's turning the hearts of the father to the children, hearts of the children to the father. It says, the earth is moaning and groaning for the sons of God to manifest. Listen, the earth is crying out for actually a people to actually fall in love and be in awe of a father. There's a fatherless generation that's crying out. And it literally might look like, F you. All these things to Christians, it might look way different than we think it should look like. And I'm just being frank with you. The moaning and groaning looks like maybe millennials not having a work ethic. They're moaning and groaning for actually sons and daughters who know who they are, who know whose they are, who know their identity, who know their place, who know their position, and who know the person Jesus to actually manifest and portray the true nature of God and the, of who the Father really is. That's the son's manif that's the moaning and the groaning. That's the tension in the earth. That's the tension in the politics right now. That's what's happening. That's moaning and groaning. Heroin addiction is the moaning and groaning and the longing for people to be in genuine covenant with the Lord. These are just symptoms of heartbreak. These things and these issues that we're going through, they're symptoms of hurt and abandonment and abuse earlier on in their lives. Listen, this stuff that we, we overlook and we're like, well, that's just the enemy. Well, the enemy's using it, so how about the sons and daughters manifest who know a good father? We win. I, I just, I want to end with this story. I remember when we held Chloe, you know, for, <laughs> for one of the first times. You're holding this baby, and you can relate to this. I'm sure any person here who has a child, you hold that baby in your arms. You hold that baby in your hands. And you're looking at the perfection that God just created through you. You're looking at that. You're, you're embracing that. And you're meeting this child for the first time. And you love that child unconditionally. Listen, Chloe didn't do anything to deserve it. Her color didn't matter. The color of her skin didn't matter. The color of her hair, her eyes, nothing. She didn't do anything to merit it. She didn't have accolades yet. She didn't have awards yet. She didn't have anything. She was just a pooping, crying, screaming, sleeping baby. And all of those are miserable except the sleeping part. So, but you're looking at this baby, and, and, and I just remember holding her, and for the first time in my life, I started to understand what unconditional love is. Amen. It's undeserving. It's unmerited. It's unearned. It's, you, don't, you can't even fathom it. But all of a sudden, you start to experience this love that you have for this child for no reason whatsoever on the planet. And then all of a sudden, I started to realize, wait, that's the love our Father poured out on us. That's the love that sent him to the cross. That's the love that he adopts us with the spirit of adoption. In Romans 8 and Galatians 4, he promises us the spirit of adoption, where we can cry out, Abba, Father, translated, Daddy. We can cry these things out, and it says we're an heir to the throne. We're an heir to heaven. We're an heir to the kingdom. Listen, everything that is in heaven belongs to you because you have a legal right. You have a legal right to it. I remember when we were in court with, I have some nephews who have been adopted, and, and I remember being in court, and I remember the judge asking, does anybody have a problem with this? No. And she asked every family member, and I remember this on, on a couple occasions, asked every family member, do you agree to help this child grow up in a loving family? Do you agree to help parent? Do you agree to be an uncle? Do you agree? And then the, the, most of the tension was on the mom and the dad. Do you agree to love this child unconditionally? And then all of a sudden at the end, the gavel comes down. I now make it official that so-and-so was adopted with a new last name. You know, this is a funny, Scott, my good friend who in New Zealand told this story about his son Oren. And when he adopted him at four years old, he was in front of the magistrate and he's adopting his wife's son. And, and he's about four years old. And, and he goes, okay, the judge, she, she asked Oren, okay, what do you want your name to be? And his name was Oren Matthew, and I forget their main name, but it's, it's Hispanic signing, Ortez or something, I don't know. But anyway, it was Oren Matthew. And he says, I want to be Oren Matthew Scott Thompson. 
They had told him that he would take on the last name Thompson, that his name would change. And he's like, he wanted it all. He didn't fathom it. So, so officially the judge says, okay, your new name is Orrin Matthew Scott Thompson. So his legal name now is, is, has Scott Thompson in it. Why? Because he wanted it all. And listen, there's more legal rights that he has, that an adopted child has than a natural birth child. It has went to court. It's already been proven. Let me, let me just finish this up. For the sake of time, I have to hurry. If I chose or if something bad happened and I leave Nicole, she has to sue me, take me to court, and fight for parental rights that I support them. Listen, if, if one of my siblings who adopted a child left, guess what? The court's already ruled. They don't have to sue. They don't have to court to fight that. It's already guaranteed you're going to provide for that child the rest of their life, no matter what. Here's the other cool thing about that. You were chosen. Adoption means you were a chosen people. You're a chosen daughter. You're a chosen son. You weren't a mistake. You weren't an accident. You weren't a night of fun. You were chosen. Stand with me as the band comes. Listen, there's something about this. 1 John 3, 1 says, See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And then with an explanation point at the end, he says, That is what you are. Listen, we are the children of God. And we have the greatest father in the universe as an example for us. We have the greatest father in the universe who chose us at the beginning of time, who actually chose us to be loved by him, to love him, and to be empowered by him, and sent and then welcomed back home every time. Listen, this is, this is the father. It, and, and, and it's unearned. It's unmerited. It doesn't matter what lifestyle you had before this. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter what money's in the bank. It doesn't matter if you've been divorced, if you've had an abortion. None of that matters at the sudden moment that you say yes to Jesus. He enters your heart. He fills you up. And then the spirit of adoption comes upon you. Nothing else matters. It'd be a very boring place if we all looked the same, acted the same, and had the same story. God is a creative artist, and God had created a system. When his children chose sin over him, he had a system to actually welcome us back into a family. Listen, Adam and Eve weren't kept from the garden for punishment. They were kept from the garden for protection, because if they had eaten from the tree in the middle of the garden, the second tree, it would have been eternal separation from the Father. God desires family. He says on three occasions, he tells us to pray like this and pray this, the Lord's Prayer. And it starts with, Our Father who are in heaven. Listen, our Father, he's, he, he's created a system of family to welcome us into the family, to operate as a family. Listen, the moment you get saved, you believe in Jesus. You believe in Jesus the moment you get saved, but the moment that you actually realize he believes in you, you get transformed. It's this amazing thing. I just remember that time and time again, all of a sudden I just have these love encounters with God the Father. Today he's wanting to encounter you. Micah's going to finish this up and just wrap this up and invite you into an encounter with his love. Invite you into an encounter with Abba Father. Come on. We just, I really feel like we were praying together earlier and we just really feel like God's just going to release the spirit of adoption. And just just go deeper, wreck us. What, you know, Take us deeper into the love of the Father. We can always use more of revelation, more discovering of how good this Father is, how good He really is to us. And I felt like God wants to just go after mindsets today. Like, how many of you know, like, you know, our mind still needs some catching up to what's true of our spirit. Like, God's like, man, you are a perfect, beautiful daughter and son, but you're transformed by the renewal of your mind. Your mind needs some cleaning up. Your mind needs some shifting and some changing. Repentance changes the way you think, some renewal in your thinking. And I felt like there's maybe there, God's tugging at your heart. That there's some of you. It's like God's tugging at this thing of a prodigal. Where I'm not talking about like you're you've, you've run away or you're, or you're just squandering your inheritance on bad living. And you could be that today. And I want to encourage you two things. I feel like two responses. One, if you are here and you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never come home to the Father. You've never come home to the Father. You've never come home to the family. I want to invite you today to respond to the Father, to come home to the Father with open arms. He's receiving you with open arms. He loves you with a reckless love. Come home. Come home today. And you can come forward and we're going to pray with you with everybody else. You can come forward, but I want to—I want you, the rest of you, to respond. If you, if you feel a tugging in your heart and if you feel God 
pointing at different things in your mind, prodigal things in your mind, where you feel like you're not submitted to the Father in some areas of your life, where you feel like maybe you have to try to prove or achieve or perform to get the Father's love. You have to achieve something. You have to perform to obtain the Father's love. There's different areas in our life that we feel like are untouched from this love. I want you to come forward, and God's going to fill you with the love of God today. He's going to fill you up with His love. Fill you up with His love.